On June 2nd and 3rd, 2011, the Center for Design and Geopolitics held its first annual conference in La Jolla at Cal IT2, the California Institute of Telecommunications and Information Technology, on the campus of the University of California at San Diego. There's lots of ways to invent things. Um, you can invent things by banging two bricks together, as the saying goes, and finding out what happens. Um, there's also ways of inventing things by figuring out how to freeze the constellation of a concept just long enough to name it, just long enough to give it a form that has a durability enough that it can be communicated. And in its communication, it comes to take on a life of its own. And our next speaker, Werner Vinge, is kind of master of this form of engineering. In his 1981 novel, True Names, um, was arguably the, the, um, I think the, the first novel that gave us a, a really fully fleshed out version of what we would later call cyberspace. Uh, in his uh, 1982, a year later, um, at a panel, um, Werner proposed that in the near future, technology would accelerate the evolution of intelligence itself, leading to a kind of, quote, singularity beyond which merely human extrapolation is essentially impossible. A word and an idea that has come to take on a life of its own in more ways than one. Werner uh, is uh, 19, 2006 novel, Rainbow's End, which, which Ed has um, already uh, are, are referred to, happens to take place here in our, our environs here at UCSD. You'll be pleased or frightened to learn about the book digitization and uh, evacuation process currently undergoing at Geisel Library, uh, which plays a key part in the book um, in a, in a uh, du dubi dubious manner. Um, uh, so what more to be said. Um, uh, a, a true inventor and, and, um, and a, a, a real genius. Werner Vinge, thank you. I'm very pleased to be here and very grateful to be uh, invited. It's been a pleasure to listen to the uh, uh, other talks. Um, Ben's uh, written description uh, for, for, for this panel uh, highlights uh, several points that I want to make. Um, first is the word Anthropocene. Uh, I usually hear this word uh, as part of a Anthropocene era um, in analogy with other uh, eras such as the Eocene and the Pleistocene. In fact, I think the Anthropocene uh, is and will be so short uh, that it would be better called an event. And uh, the proper analogy uh, is with the ev event that ended the Cretaceous period uh, than it uh, is with any uh, geological era. Of course, the Cretaceous tertiary event was an asteroid impact that uh, arguably took uh, just an hour or two. Uh, the Anthropocene has already taken more time than that, though, though it is still uh, uh, vanishingly brief in the history of, of the Earth. Uh, so uh, we, we certainly hope that the uh, Anthropocene event or the Anthropic event uh, won't be so destructive of the top species as the uh, uh, KT impact was. Um, nevertheless, I think that the Anthropocene marks uh, a transition that's even more important than the KT impact. Um, I think you'd actually have to go back half a billion years to find a change as profound as the transition um, uh, that we're, we're going through now. Uh, half a billion years ago takes us back to the uh, Cambrian explosion uh, in which vastly new and complex life forms appeared in the geological record uh, of the Earth. Now we humans have been messing around with the ecosphere for some thousands of years and recently uh, the effects of what we've been doing have been clearly discernible. Um, giving rise to the, uh, the term the Anthropocene era. Um, ben also mentioned in his uh, uh, introduction, uh, in the, the written in, in, in introduction, and, 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 and just now, um, about the 
uh, Copernican uh, revolution that's inherent in these events. And I, I certainly uh, uh, agree uh, with that. Um, we humans have been central to the mess ups of the last uh, few millennia, but in fact, we are just now triggering the event um, that we will be remembered for and for our true claim to greatness. Um, I think that after that, um, afterwards, the story won't be about us anymore. Um, and of course, uh, the development that I'm thinking of here is the is, is pervasive uh, computational technology and the rise of um, uh, uh, superhuman intelligence uh, beyond, uh, beyond biological substrates. Um, and so I'm talking about the technological uh, singularity. Um, I see one of the arguments that we, we are on track toward the technological singularity is that in fact there's a lot of different things that are going on that are different paths uh, toward a situation where uh, the world is dominated by superhuman intelligences. And let me list what I think are the, are the top four and um, talk about some of them briefly. One is where it all began, I think, in, in speculation about, the, about uh, uh, these sorts of issues, and that is classical, uh, pure artificial intelligence. You know, you just have a very, 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 very smart machine. Um, the IBM Jeopardy machine all grown up, so to speak, passing the, the, the Turing test uh, along the way. Um, another path to the singularity is um, one that is much more congenial to the, the average person who worries about such thing, and that is the notion of intelligence amplification. Uh, science fiction writer David Brin uh, uh, put that put that possibility well when he talked about imagining um, access to uh, human access to computer to, uh, support uh, being so transparent and easy uh, that we might regard uh, 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 external computation um, as a kind of neo-neocortex uh, to the human brain so that even though the devices aren't physically stuck onto our head, um, the, the effect is that uh, uh, we are uh, thinking outside of ourselves, even though we are still the things that are in charge. And what David, David's vision is that uh, the machine provides the uh, horsepower and we provide what humans are uh, really good for, and that is providing uh, uh, motivation and, and uh, get up and go. And in fact, if you look at the history of, of humans, I think one thing that is maybe the best characterization of humans is that um, more than any other uh, creature that we outsource cognitive function. Uh, so for instance, there are many birds that are smart enough to remember where they have hidden hundreds of seeds. That's far better than I could do with an equivalent problem unless you gave me a paper and pencil, in which case I could probably beat the bird. Uh, so uh, this is actually a, 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 a sequence or a trajectory that we have been on for some time. Uh, writing is an outsourcing of cognitive function, and what we've been up to in the last 50 or 60 years has certainly been an intensification of that. The third path to the singularity um, that is also going like gangbusters, and, is mu and, and probably of all the things of all the four paths I'm going to talk about is the one that's the most um, uh, obviously successful and credible is the combination of computer networks and the, on, and the ensemble of humanity. Uh, so the, the internet and the people who use the internet. Um, that actually is, is well enough understood now that it probably doesn't need any more uh, a a explanation to virtually any audience uh, in the world um, that has cell phones. The, the fourth path is one that is quite familiar to people here, but I think it's in, in general uh, not widely appreciated, and that is the, the spread of um, networked, uh, embedded, uh, and standalone uh, processors. 
uh, I call this uh, a, a digital Gaia. And uh, if, if you talk to Larry Smarr for very long, uh, he brings up, brings up a, a similar feeling about um, a uh, sort of silicon ecosphere that's uh, uh, spreading ar around the earth. Um, and uh, this, this is one that is actually, uh, I like to point to because there's a fundamental alienness to it that I think makes it plausible that we're not talking about an event here with a singularity that is so much analogous to the rise of humankind within the animal kingdom, which is, that's the common analogy and a good analogy, I think, for what the singularity is about. That it's the, the, the most recent event that is com comparable in, in magnitude and importance to the technological singularity is the rise of humans within the animal kingdom. But in fact, a better analogy is the Cambrian explosion that we are looking at a variety of different types or species of mind. And the digital Gaia is kind of a perfect example of that. Um, uh, it, it, if, if it c comes to pass, in a way, um, it would look more like the physical world waking up than it would anything else. And in fact, uh, people who think that the singularity is very likely uh, are, are often uh, accused of, of being um, uh, religious apocalypse types dressing up their secret wishes uh, in technological garb. Uh, hence the term, uh, hence the complaint that the singularity is, is just uh, uh, the uh, rapture for the geeks. Um, I think that uh, the uh, possibility of digital Gaia kind of shows that although the singularity is something uh, of such extraordinary uh, uh, dimensions that it's easy to make religious analogies about it. Uh, there is not an obvious uh, religious analogy to talk about. For instance, Digital Gaia, more than anything else, um, uh, looks like some sort of um, animism uh, dressed up in technological garb. Um, Well, if you, uh, the, way, the way I look at things happening in the future is that no one knows what the future is going to bring. Predictions are, are really probably not the right way to look at uh, what's happening in, in, in what might happen in the future. A better way to look at uh, the future is to think in terms of separate scenarios. And for the purposes of, uh, keeping it down to the size of our human minds, probably several extreme scenarios for things that are going on. Um, some of them are scenarios that are so purely uh, uh, to be avoided that uh, we may shrink from thinking about them. For, for instance, very widespread uh, nuclear war, combinations of widespread nuclear war and biological war, um, existential threats of, the, of that sort, that's a type of scenario. And we hope that it's not very likely, and we'd go to great lengths to, uh, we would like to think that societies would go to great lengths to prevent those from happening. Um, then there are scenarios that are merely catastrophic, uh, such as some of the scenarios that were, were described earlier today. Uh, the singularity is a type of technological singularity, uh, excuse me, a type of technological uh, scenario. Um, and it is sometimes pointed to with the same sort of uh, unease that we talk about uh, the, the other mess ups that uh, humankind does with technology. I, I think it's very easy to be uneasy, it's very easy to be uneasy about the uh, singularity. Um, but it's not because it's such a terrible thing. If it were to happen a million years from now, I think most people would regard it as a, as a heartwarming affirmation of the endpoint of all strips, human struggle for betterment. The idea that it could happen before most of the people in this room have retired is where it gets to be uh, something that makes us uh, 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 uneasy. Uh, so the right way, I think, to think about scenarios such as this is to rank them in your own mind as to what you personally think their likelihood is. But of all the scenarios that, are, that you judge to be of non-zero probability, you should be running those in background mode when you look at events that are happening in, in, the, in the real world. 
And as you run in background mode for all the different scenarios that you give any uh, possibility to, you can assign uh, new types of, or new probability levels to what's going on for each of those scenarios. You can also revise your own personal and your, and your group trajectories for how you're going to deal with them. For instance, there may be scenarios where you can, um, you can group your responses. If you, it, in, anytime you find a particular type of behavior that actually responds to your top probability uh, or, or your, your, your top important uh, scenarios, that sounds kind of a, a, kind of a, 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 a good thing uh, uh, to think about. Um, I think in the case of, of, the, uh, uh, of, of the singularity, imagining it is something that is happening at the same time and with the same time scale as the more acute um, results of the uh, climate change uh, 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 trajectories that uh, were talked about earlier today is, is a good thing to run in parallel uh, in one's mind. Um, if the singularity does, does happen and does happen on such a time scale, um, then it certainly does interact uh, with the things that are happening with, uh, uh, with, with climate change. Uh, I want to point out a, 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 a couple of things in dealing with uh, a scenario, a singularity scenario and planning for such event that I think um, uh, gives some reason for behaving in certain ways and also gives some confidence. One is that although one of my articles of faith, I guess, is that given the nature of, this, of, the, of the scenario, the rise of superhuman intelligence, um, that we're not really in a position to talk very much about what's it like afterwards. On the other hand, the run-up to the singularity, the years that are preceding that, should see uh, a, a number of incremental steps toward it, and in particular, the scenarios that involve, uh, the sub-scenarios that involve humanities, uh, interaction with computers, actually, um, should lead to a greater understanding on the part of the, of the human players as they approach the, uh, uh, the uh, transition to understand what's going on and actually to act as first movers and to make things uh, perhaps have, have a safer outcome than they would otherwise. So in a way, all the bad things that we see happening from day to day with network security and with other computer flaws um, might be regarded as a, as a welcome form of friction. Uh, because if this is an event corresponding in magnitude to the Cambrian explosion, um, the really, really dangerous thing about it is that it's happening in 40 years and not 40 million years or, four, or, or 100 million years. That there's a whole lot of learning that has to go on that uh, uh, is being compressed into less than one human lifetime. And so anytime we can uh, uh, do the coevolution in many steps rather than very large uh, extinctual steps, that's a, 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 a good idea. I think another thing is that um, uh, we, we should uh, keep in mind that life as a whole, and wh uh, which the, this new world is really part of that life as a whole, um, more than anything else is an example of subroutine threaded code. That is, if you look inside a cell, the, the cell is a miracle, the, the biological cell is a miracle, but it really is, in large part, a list of subroutine calls. That's one reason that it can achieve its complexity. So Venter's um, uh, synthetic life experiment, uh, if you look at it at all, at all uh, it, one sees that it is actually um, revealing an enormous number of, of dependencies upon things that exist in the outside world. I see no reason why this situation should change uh, as we move into the uh, uh, post-human or, or, uh, or, or, or post-singularity uh, era, that um, the, uh, post, the, uh, the post-human entities, whatever they are, I think will find it impractical to impossible to, um, to divest themselves of the biological era, and, and in fact, would be, would be very dangerous for them to, to do so, since we can always bring them back if they were to disappear in some disaster. We can't help ourselves. We like to experiment with these things. 
But if all biological life, or even all human life, disappeared one rainy night, then actually there would be nothing to bring the machines back if they later should uh, uh, happen upon a catastrophe. Finally, Ed said uh, something uh, that, uh, I, uh, that I think he characterized as a, a pessimistic factor, a, a pessimistic possibility, and it's certainly a scary possibility to me, and that is the possibility that we are alone in the universe, that there is no life anywhere else in the universe, there, and that there never has been any life anywhere else in the universe. The, um, the British uh, uh, astronomer, Martin Rees, uh, had a very nice little essay about that in his book, Our Final Hours, encouraging title, that. Um, and in that, he makes a statement that he's been studying this issue for a long time, and he thinks we are alone in the universe. This is the first time in the universe that there has ever been uh, uh, intelligent life, perhaps also the first place, the only place in the universe that there has ever been life. And he makes a very important point about that, which is at the same time very, very scary and very important. And that is if that uh, intuition is true, then that means that this century on Earth is the most important time and place in the universe. So uh, we have our work cut out for us. Thank you.